hey, you know what time it is. Get into it. We are back with another reading of the Never Ending Story by Michael and Duh. Look at Falcor. For all my fans of the movie, that's how Falcor originally looked for the book. And we have Bastion. And we have a few other characters that we will meet as we progress through the story. Um, but for those who were not here for the first reading, for the prologue, that is available for you to look at later. I do not own the music that you're listening to in the background. Also, for those who watch Storytime on Facebook, um, we just finished the first book in the Redwall series by Brian Jakes. Love that. Love that series. I hope that I can come back to it and read more of the subsequent books after that if people are interested. But I wanted to let you all know that also on Facebook... For our Christmas themed or Christmas holiday book, I should say, is going to be one of my other favorites, Peter Pan by J.M. Barry, or otherwise known as Peter and Wendy. That is the original title by James M. Barry. And I, I don't know, I love the story. It's just magical. It's magical and it pushes you to realize that just because you grow up doesn't mean you have to forget about what it was like to be a kid. And the magic of what it meant to be a kid. But, without further ado, we will begin. Ah, okay, okay. I thought I had skipped a page. Okay, making sure. So, the last time we were here, Bastian Balthazar Bucks had stolen the never-ending story from Carl Conrad Coriander's bookshop. And he is now holed up in the attic of his school because now that he's a thief and he's he's basically run away because he doesn't want to get in trouble. And he's just like, well, I can't go back home because I'll disappoint my dad. And then I can't go back to class because I'm super late to school. So now he's about to delve into a world both familiar and yet new to the eye. We're about to get into it. Chapter 1. Fantastica in Danger. So, fun fact, each chapter is a letter of the alphabet, and they each have their own illustrations. Some of the characters you can recognize on the cover. We've got the Will-O-The-Wisp. We've got our tiny people. And then Nighthob. And then we got Rockbiter down here for those who remember the movie. Which, by the way, I know some people are going to comment like you're saying the land's name wrong, but in the original book, um, it is called Fantastica, which is right here. I think they changed it to Fantasia because that just seems smoother on the tongue. It's just easily more rememberable, memorable than Fantastica. All the beasts in Howling Forest were safe in their caves, nests, and burrows. It was midnight. The storm wind was whistling through the tops of the great ancient trees. The towering trunks creaked and groaned. Suddenly, a faint light came zigzagging through the woods, stopped here and there, trembling fitfully, flew up into the air, rested on a branch, and a moment later hurried on. It was a glittering sphere about the size of a child's ball. It moved in long leaps, touched the ground now and then, then bowed it up again. But it wasn't a ball. It was a will of the will of, will of the wisp. It had lost its way, and that's something quite unusual here, even in Fantastica, because ordinarily will of the wisp make others lose their way. Inside this ball of light, there was a small, exceedingly active figure which ran and jumped with all its might. It was neither male nor female, for such distinctions don't exist among will of the wisps. In its right hand, it carried a tiny white flag which glittered behind it. That meant it was either a messenger or a flag of truce bearer. you think it would have bumped into a tree leaping like that in the darkness, but there was no danger of that, for will-o'-the-wisps are incredibly nimble and can change directions in the middle of a leap. That explains the zigzagging, but in a general sort of way, it moved in a definite direction. Up to that moment, when it came to a jutting crag and started back in a fright, Whimpering like a puppy, it sat down on the fork of a tree and pondered a while before venturing out and cautiously looking around the crag. Up ahead, it saw a clearing in the woods. 
and there in the light of a campfire sat three figures of different sizes and shapes. A giant who looked as if half the whole of him were made of gray stone lay stretched out on his belly. He was almost ten feet long, propped up on one elbow, he was looking into the fire. His weather-beaten stone face, which seemed strangely small in comparison with his powerful shoulders, his teeth stood out like a row of steel chisels. The Will-o'-the-Wisp recognized him as belonging to the family of rock chewers. These were creatures who lived in a mountain range inconceivably far from Howling Forest, but they do not only live in the mountain range, they also lived on it. L little by little, they were eating it up. Rocks were their only food. Luckily, a little went a long way. They could live for weeks and months on a single bite of this, for them, extremely nutritious fare. There weren't very many rock chewers, and besides, it was a large mountain range. But since these giants had been there a long time, they lived to a greater age than most of the inhabitants of Fantastica. Those mountains had come over the years to look very strange, like an enormous Swiss cheese full of holes and grottos, and that is why they were known as the Cheesy Wheezies. But the rock chewers not only fed on stone, they made everything they needed out of it. Furniture, hats, shoes, tools, even cuckoo clocks. But it was not surprising that the vehicle of this particular giant was now leaning against a tree behind him it was a sort of bicycle made entirely of this material which two wheels that look like enormous millstones in the hole it suggested a stone roller with pedals the second figure who was sitting to the right of the first was a little night hob no more than twice the size of the will of the wisp he looked like a pitch black furry caterpillar sitting up he had little pink hands, with which he gestured violently as he spoke, and below his tasseled black hair, two big round eyes glowed like moons in what was presumably his face. Since there were night hobs of all shapes and sizes in every part of Fantastica, it was hard to tell by the sight of him whether this one had come from far or near. But one could guess that he was traveling because the usual mount of the night hobs, a large bat. Wrapped in its wings like a closed umbrella, was hanging head down from a nearby branch. It took the Will of the Wisp some time to discover the third person on the left side of the fire, for he was so small as to be scarcely discernible from that distance. He's one of the tinies, a delicate, built little fellow in a bright colored suit and a top hat. The Will of the Wisp knew next to nothing about tidies, but it had once heard that these people built whole cities in the branches of trees, and that the houses were connected by stairways, rope ladders, and ramps, but the tinies lived in an entirely different part of the boundless fantastic, fantastic, fantasia, I'm gonna say this word right, F Fantastican Empire. There we go. No wonder they changed the name, because that's a mouthful. <laughs> uh, even further away than the rock chewers, which made it all the more amazing that the mount, which had evidently carried the tiny all this way, was, of all things, a snail. Its pink shell was surmounted by a gleaming silver saddle, and its bridle, as well as the reins fastened to its feelers, glittered like silver threads. The Will of the Wisp couldn't get over it that three such different creatures should be sitting was by no means the rule in Fantastica. Battles and wars were frequent, and certain of the species had been known to feud for hundreds of years. Moreover, not all the inhabitants of Fantastica were good and honorable. There were also thieving, wicked, and cruel ones. The Will of the Wisp itself belonged to a family that was hardly reputed for truthfulness or reliability. After observing the scene in the firelight for some time, the Will of the Wisp noticed that each of the three had something white, either a flag or a white scarf, worn across his chest, which meant that they were messengers or flag of truce bearers, and that of course accounted for the peaceful atmosphere. Could they be traveling on the same business as the Will of the Wisp? What were they saying couldn't be heard from a distance because of the howling wind in the trees tops, but since they respected one another as messengers, might they recognize the will of the wisp in the same capacity and refrain from harming him? It had to ask someone the way, and there seemed little likelihood of finding a better opportunity at this hour in the middle of the woods. So plucking up courage, it ventured out of its hiding place and hovered trembling in midair, waving its white flag. The rock truer whose face was turned in that direction was first to notice the will of the wisp. Lots of traffic around here tonight, he crackled. Here comes another one. Oh, it's a will-o'-the-wisp, whispered the night hob. His moon eyes glowed. Please don't.
The tiny stood up, took a few steps towards the newcomer, and chirped. If my eyes don't deceive me, you are here as a messenger. Yes, indeed, said the Will-o'-the-Wisp. The tiny removed his red top hat, made a slight bow, and twittered. Oh, do join us. We too are messengers. Why won't you be seated? And with his hat, he motioned toward an empty place by the fire. Many thanks, said the Will-o'-the-Wisp, coming timidly closer. Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Blub. Delighted, said the tiny. My name is Gluckick. The night hob bowed without getting up. My name is Vushvazul. And mine, the rock chewer crackled, is Pjorn Kragzark. All three looked at the Will-o'-the-Wisp who was wriggling with embarrassment. Will-o'-the-Wisps find it most unpleasant to be looked full in the face. Won't you sit down, dear Blub? said the tiny. To tell the truth, said the Will-o'-the-Wisp, I'm in a terrible hurry. I only wanted to ask if by any chance you knew the way to the ivory tower. Oh, said the night hob. Could you be going to see the childlike empress? Exactly, said the Will-o'-the-Wisp. I have an important message for her. What does it say? The rock chewer crackled. But you see, said the Will-o'-the-Wisp, shifting its way from foot to foot, it's a secret message. All three of us who have the same message as you, replied Vushvazul, the night hob. That makes us partners. Maybe we even have the same message, said Gluckick, the tiny. Sit down and tell us, pure Kragzark crackled. The will of the wisp sat down in the empty place. My home, it began with a moment's hesitation, is a long way from here. I don't know if any of those present has heard. It's called Moldymore. Who cried the night hob delightedly. A lovely country. The will of the wisp smiled faintly. Yeah, isn't it? Is that all you have to say, Blub? Purin Krezark crackled. What is the purpose of your trip? Something has happened in Moldymore, said the Will o' the Wisp haltingly. Haltingly, something impossible to understand. Actually, it's still happening. It's hard to describe. The way it began was well. In the east of our country, there is a lake. That is. There was a lake. Lake Foaming Broth, we call it. Well, the way it began was like this. One day, Lake Foaming Broth wasn't there anymore. It was gone. See? You mean it dried up? Gluckick inquired. No, said the Will-o'-the-Wisp. Then there'd be a dried up lake. But there isn't. Where the lake used to be, there's nothing. Absolutely nothing. Now do you see? A hole? The rock chewer grunted. No, not a hole, said the will of the wisp despairingly. A hole, after all, is something. This is nothing at all. The three other messengers exchanged glances. What hole does this nothing look like? asked the night hob. That's just what's so hard to describe, said the will of the wisp unhappily. It doesn't look like anything. It's, it's like, oh, there's no word for it. Maybe, the tiny suggested, when you look at the place, it's as if you were blind. The will of the wisp stared open-mouthed. Exactly, it cried, but where? I mean, how? I mean, have you had the same? Wait a minute, the rock chewer crackled. Was it only this one place? At first, yes, the will of the wisp explained. That is, the place got bigger little by little. But then all of a sudden, Fogel, the father of the frogs, who lived in Lake Froming Broth with his family, was gone too. Some of the inhabitants started running away, but little by little, the same thing happened to other places of Moldymore. It usually started with just a little chunk, no bigger than a partridge egg. But then these chunks got bigger and bigger. If somebody put his foot into one of them by mistake, the foot or hand or whatever else he put in it would be gone too. It didn't hurt. It was just that a part of whoever it was would be missing. Some would even fall on, on purpose if they got too close to the nothing. It has an irresistible attraction. The bigger the place, the stronger the pull. None of us can imagine what this terrible thing might be, what caused it, or what we could do about it. And seeing that it didn't go away by itself but kept spreading, we finally decided to send a messenger to the childlike empress to ask her for advice and help. Well, I'm that messenger. <laughs>
The three others gaze silently into space. After a while, the night hop sighed. Oh, it's the same where I come from, and I'm traveling on the exact same errand. Woohoo! The tiny turned to the will o' the wisp. Each one of us, he chirped, comes from a different province of Fantastica. We've met here entirely by chance, but each of one of us is going to the childlike empress with the same message. And the message, grated the rapture, is that all Fantastica is in danger. The will o' the wisp cast a terrified look at each one in turn. If that's the case, it cried, jumping up. We haven't a moment to lose. We were just going to start, said the tidy. We only stopped to rest because it's so awfully dark here in Howling Forest. But now that you've joined us, Blub, you can light the way. Impossible, said the Will-o'-the-Wisp. Would you expect me to wait for someone who rides a snail? Sorry. But it's a racing snail, said the tidy, somewhat miffed. Otherwise, hoo-hoo, the night hop sighed. We won't tell you which way to go. Who are you people talking to? The rock chewer crackled. And sure enough, the Will-o'-the-Wisp hadn't even heard the other messenger's last words, for he was already flinting through the forest in long leaps. Oh well, said the tiny, pushing his top hat onto the back of his head. Maybe it wouldn't have been such a good idea to follow a Will-o'-the-Wisp. To tell you the truth, said the night hop, I prefer to travel on my own because I, for one, fly. With a quick hoo-hoo, he ordered his bat to make ready and whoosh away he flew the rock chewer put out the campfire with the palm of his hand rattling and grinding he rode his stone bike straight into the woods now and then thudding into a giant tree slowly the clatter receded in the distance gluckick the tiny was last to set out he seized the silvery reins and said all right we'll see who gets there first gee up old timer gee up and he clicked his tongue and then there was nothing to be heard but the storm wind howling in the treetops. Excuse me. The clock in the belfry struck nine. Reluctantly, Bastion's thoughts turned back to reality. He was glad the Neverending Story had nothing to do with that. He didn't like books in which dull, cranky writers describe humdrum events and the very humdrum lives of humdrum people. Reality gave him enough of that kind of thing. Why should he read about it? Besides, he couldn't stand when a writer tried to convince him of something. And these humdrum books, it seemed to him, were always trying to do just that. Bastion liked books that were exciting or funny or that made him dream. Books were made up characters had marvelous adventures books that made him imagine all sorts of things because one thing he was good at possibly the only thing was imagining things so clearly that he almost saw and heard them when he told himself stories he sometimes forgot everything around him and awoke as though from a dream only when the story was finished and this book was just like his own stories in reading it, he had heard not only the creaking of the big trees and the howling of the wind in the trees tops, but also the different voices of the four comical messengers. And he almost seemed to catch the smell of moss and forest earth. Down in the classroom, they were starting in on nature study. That consisted almost entirely of counting pistols and stamens. Bastion was glad to be up here in his hiding place where he could read. This, he thought, was just the right book for him. A week later, Vush Vazul, the little night hob, arrived at his destination. He was the first. Or rather, he thought he was the first because he was riding through the air. Just as the setting sun turned the clouds to liquid gold, he noticed that his bat was circling over the labyrinth. That was the name of an enormous garden extending from horizon to horizon and filled with the most bewitching scents and dreamlike colors. Broad avenues and narrow paths twinned their way among copses, lawns, and beds of the rarest, strangest flowers in a design so artful and intricate that the whole plain resembled an enormous maze. Of course, it had been designed only for pleasure and amusement, with no intention of endangering anyone, much less of warding off an enemy. It would have been useless for such purposes, and the childlike empress required no such protection, because in all the unbounded reaches of Fantastica, there was no one who would have thought of attacking her. For that, there was a reason, as we shall soon see. While gliding soundlessly over the flower maze, the night hob sighted all sorts of animals. In a small clearing between lilacs and laburnum, 
A group of young unicorns were playing in the evening sun, and once glancing under a giant bluebell, he even thought he saw the famous phoenix in its nest. But he wasn't quite certain, as such was his haste, that he didn't want to turn back to make sure. For at the center of the labyrinth there now appeared, shimmering in fair whiteness, the ivory tower, the heart of Fantastica, and the residence of the childlike empress. The word tower might give someone who has never seen it the wrong idea. It had nothing of the church or castle about it. The ivory tower was as big as a whole city. From a distance, it looked like a pointed mountain peak twisted like a snail shell. Its highest point was deep in the clouds. Only on coming closer could you notice that this great sugar loaf consisted of innumerable towers, turrets, domes, roofs, orioles, terraces, arches, stairways, and balustrades, all marvelously fitted together. The whole was made of the whitest fantastican ivory, so delicately carved in every detail that it might have been taken for the lattice work of the finest lace. These buildings house the childlike empress's court, her chamberlains and maidservants, wise women and astrologers, magicians and jesters, messengers, cooks and acrobats, her tightrope walkers and storytellers, heralds, gardeners, watchmen, tailors, shoemakers, and alchemists. And at the very summit of the great tower lived the childlike empress in a pavilion shaped like a magnolia blossom. On certain nights, when the full moon shone most gloriously in the starry sky, the ivory petals opened wide and the childlike empress would be sitting in the middle of the glorious flower. Riding on his bath, the little night hob landed on one of the low terraces where the stables were located. Someone must have announced his arrival, for five imperial grooms were there waiting for him. They helped him out of his saddle, bowed to him, and held out the ceremonial welcome cup. As etiquette demanded, Vush Vazul took only a sip and then returned the cup. Each of the grooms took a sip, then they bowed again and led the bat to the stables. All this was done in silence. On reaching its appointed place, the bat touched neither food nor drink, but immediately rolled up, hung itself up down on a hook, and fell into a deep sleep. So just give you an example just like and nah, 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 nah. but upside down obviously because it's a bat the little night hop had demanded a bit too much of his mount the grooms left it alone and kept away from the stable on tiptoes in this stable, there were many other mounts, two elephants, one pink and one blue, a giant griffin with the four quarters of an eagle and the hind quarters of a lion, a winged horse whose name was once known even outside of Fantastica, but is now forgotten. Several flying dogs, a few other bats, and several dragonflies and butterflies for especially small riders, which, this is my own headcanon. Actually, I'm not going to reveal what that flying horse I think is from. We'll talk about it because we'll probably hold on. Okay. Okay, hold on, because I want to make. Oh, okay. So it's chapter. What says chapter twelve is when we have the deep revelation. Yes, yes. When we get to chapter 12, I'll explain about this portion of the story later. In other stables, there were other mounts, but which still fly but ran, which didn't fly but ran, crawled, hopped, or swam. And each had a groom of its own to feed and take care of it. Ordinarily, one would have expected to hear quite a canopy of different voices, roaring, screeching, piping, chirping, croaking, and chattering. But that day was... There was utter silence. <coughs> oh, excuse me. The little night hob was still standing where the grooms had left him. Suddenly, without knowing why, he felt dejected and discouraged. He too was exhausted after the long trip, and not even the knowledge that he'd arrived first could cheer him up. Suddenly, he heard a chirping voice. Hello, hello, if it is my good friend Vushvazul. So glad you made it. The night hob looked around and his moon eyes flared with amazement. For on a balustrade, leaning... Nelig... Nelig... 
negligently neglect okay so it's neglect but why am i okay my tongue is tied y'all please bear with me I'm, i apologize not this bad Neg negligently there we go against a flower pot stood gluckick the tiny tipping his red top hat which i should get a top hat that's one hat i don't have i want a hat that like when i like unfurl it it like pops open that would be cool Hoo -hoo, went the bewildered night hob and again hoo -hoo, he just couldn't think of anything better to say the other two haven't arrived yet. I've been here since yesterday morning. How? How did you do it? Simple, said the tiny with a rather condescending smile. Didn't I tell you I had a racing snail? The night hop scratched its tangled black head fur with his little pink hand. I must go to the childlike empress at once, he said mournfully. The tiny gave him a pensive look. Hmm, he said. I put in for an appointment yesterday. Put in for an appointment? asked the night hop can't we just go in and see her i'm afraid not chirped the tiny we'll have a long wait i can't imagine how many messengers have turned up Hoo -hoo. how come the night hop sighed you better take a look for yourself the tiny twittered come with me my dear vushvazul come with me the two of them started out the high street which wound around the high tower ivory tower in a narrow spiral was clogged with a dense crowd of the strangest creatures enormous beturbaned jinns tiny kobolds three-headed trolls with bearded dwarves glittering fairies goat-legged fawns nixes with wavy golden hair sparkling snow sprites and countless others were milling about standing in groups or sitting silently on the ground discussing the situation or gazing glumly into the distance. Vushvazul stopped still when he saw them. Hoo hoo, he said, what's going on? What are all they doing here? They're all messengers, Gluckick explained. Messengers from all over Fantastica, all with the same message as ours. I've spoken with several of them. The same menace seems to have broken out everywhere. The night hob gave vent to a long wheezing sigh. Do they know, he asked, what it is and where it comes from? I'm afraid not. Nobody knows. What about the childlike empress? The childlike empress, said the tiny in an undertone, is ill. Very ill. Maybe that's the cause of this mysterious calamity that's threatening all of Fantastica. But so far, none of the many doctors who have been conferring in the Magnolia Pavilion has discovered the nature of her illness or found a cure for it. That, said the night hob breathlessly, is oh, terrible. So it is, said the tiny. In view of the circumstances, Vushvazul decided not to put in for an appointment. Two days later, Blub, the will-o'-the-wisp, arrived. Of course, he had hopped in the wrong direction and made an enormous detour. And finally, three days after that, Pjorn Krazark, the rock chewer, appeared. He came plodding along foot, for in a sudden frenzy of hunger, he had eaten his stone bike. During the long waiting period, the four so unalike messengers became good friends. For then on, they stayed together. But that's another story that shall be told another time. And that is where we will end for tonight. We will be back tomorrow with Chapter 2 of The NeverEnding Story. Thank you, y'all. See ya.